I want to talk about the holiness of God. It's, um, a couple of weeks ago we talked about the fear of the Lord and, and it's sort of connected so I thought I should do it. The holiness and the holiness is basically who God is. Um, you know, in the Bible is, uh, it mentions him one time and it describes him as indescribable light. So uh, does anyone here like to unpack that and tell me what that means? Indescribable light. That's way beyond, isn't it? And, and that's really, you know, it's, it's amazing. We, we, we've been born to learn who God is because he created us for himself. And, and, and yet he's, he's knowable, but he's unknowable. He's just an amazing person. And I think that's one of the wonders of Christianity is that we've got a hold of something in our life now, Tim, and we'll never get to the bottom of it. And so it's exciting to know we're, we're on our way to heaven and uh, we're just going to see so much more. And, and I don't think we'll ever get to know fully who he is, even when we're there, because he's just so huge, isn't he? Um, so I thought I'd, I'd like to look at that a little bit. Um, you know, can you imagine uh, how Adam and Eve must have been when they were first created and living in, in such a close relationship with God? You, you wonder why they bothered to look elsewhere, but human nature, I guess. But it must have been indescribable for them to explain what it was like to be with God face to face. And we have that wonderful privilege. Conditions allow, of course. And uh, one of the greatest conditions, of course, is God is holy. And yet in his holiness, he can somehow cause it to be okay that we can come into his presence. Terrific story. You know, I, it fascinates me how the world can get so caught up on, on issues, you know, like that are so, actually so pathetically interesting compared with the person of God. You know, it's just incredible. Indescribable. So, uh, you know, he, he came and he said, you know, um, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That alone is worth uh, a lot of contemplation, isn't it? If I see you, I've seen the Father. But it's true, isn't it? Because he's exactly who the Father is. Paul said this in um, Philippians 3, verses 8 to 10. Um, so if you can have that up, please. Because Paul was caught up with the, with the absolute, sorry, Paul was caught up with the absolute wonder that we can know God. So he said this, yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ, this is a hungry man, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. All Paul wanted to know was know Jesus. That's what made him such a great man. Just that focus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. In, in the Old Covenant, I think the people believed that they knew God, but they didn't really know the person of God. They didn't really want to, and yet they were attracted to him. So they made sure that people like Moses were there, and, and, and Moses and those giants like that, they were able to come to know God in a measure. But it was very difficult for the people. And they sort of kind of thought, well, we're God's favourites. So they lived with a sense of... Um, pretty casual relationship with God. They were easily distracted. And so time and time again, they got caught up in the things that took them away from God. And so in the end, because of God's incredible love, God had to allow them to go through different things so that all of a sudden they realized the only thing of any value is God. And we can get a bit sidetracked in the sermon today by looking at what's happening today, but. You know, if, if I was a Jew in Israel, I would go to my Bible, Old Testament, 
And I'm starting to look at that and come to the reality that this has happened before time and time and time again. I've got my, my eyes off God. I've got my eyes on everything else. And I'm starting to go and go and go until in the end, they think it's God's grace. It is that it's a grace that's there so that they'll come to a place where they'll repent. It's not a grace, it's a license. And so things start to go wrong. And so the greatest thing that can happen out of this moment is that all of a sudden we'll start to see them coming back to Jesus and, and we trust that the Palestinians will too. Because this is not the way God wants us to live, is it? Everyone loses. And it's all in the Bible. So man, you know, when, when Adam and Eve made a huge mistake, God said it. He said, if you sin, you'll die. And I don't know why they were attracted to that. I guess it was their human nature. But in the end, they went somewhere else other than God. And they, you know, and the Bible describes it as they ate the fruit off the tree and all that, well, you know. But I think the reality of this was that basically they went to another place other than God. It's amazing to think they do it. But they turned their eyes away from God and went to some other source. And you see, that's the sin of unbelief. And by not believing God and choosing something else, God said, well, there's no point anymore, is there? But in God's grace and mercy, he stored an animal and he put the skins on Adam and Eve so that, yes, they knew God was real, but they couldn't relate to him as a person. So he was always with them, but they couldn't come to know him. And so we see history goes on and on until in the end, life becomes so bad and so horrible and so lost for mankind that God sent someone. And that someone had the ability to change it all around. That someone, of course, is Jesus. And he came. And of course, he paid the ultimate price. Because God is love. But he's also justice. Because if you have love, you've got to have justice. Because if you have love without justice, you'll have license and we'll, we'll destroy ourselves. I want to, um, I want to apologise that um, for many, many years I've preached one error that I sort of came face to face with this week. And that is I used to preach that God's love is unconditional. I used to say it's unconditional, it's uncompromising, it's unchanging. That was my lie. But I saw in America this week there's some preachers in there. They're preaching to the um, the LGBTQ uh, community that God's love is unconditional. So therefore, you can do what you like and God still loves you. So you can do something that the Bible says God is a horror at the very act of homosexuality and yet it's okay because God's love's unconditional and you see God's love when you look at the Bible which I should have done seen years ago his love is not unconditional but it's unfailing it's unfailing you know and it's such a love that there was just a pure love unconditional you and I would mess ourselves up because we wouldn't consider him at all we would consider our behaviour and we would just get more unholy and unholy because we just mess our lives up. But knowing that the love that God has <clears throat> is the most precious thing we can live in is unfailing, but because it's his love, there is a justice to it. You know? We're all accountable for our actions, aren't we? That's what amazes me when I say that God is holy. I guess we've got to find out what holiness means first, don't we? And when God says it's um, light that you can't understand, well, it's a bit hard to understand. <laughs> but there are other words, aren't there? It, it, in a sense, it's like God is so other than us that he's so different to us 
but in such a purity, in such a perfect way, uh, unfaultable. It's hard to find the words to describe what holiness means, but he is holy because that's the word that fulfills who he is. You know, it doesn't doesn't quite in the Bible. It says God is holy. It doesn't say God's a little bit holy or God's holy, but there's other issues. No, God is holy, whole. He's whole, right? And he sees us today. And he sent Jesus to deal with all the justice that we had before us because of the life we've lived. And in love, he sent Jesus to pay the price, to be judged, found guilty and die on a cross so that when he rose from the dead that was all gone forgotten and we can come into it and simply as a gift because of his love we can say Jesus come into my life and everything that he did on the cross applies to us and so we can be cleansed of all those unrighteous things in our lives that separate us from God and we can now have a relationship with God who is holy don't get excited about that please <laughs> honestly it, it has to be a gift doesn't it we, we can't become holy I mean there's too many holes in us <laughs> right <laughs> but he sees us as holy because when we said Jesus came into our life, the wonderful thing is that his holiness came into our life. So the Holy One is within us through his Holy Spirit. And we walk and live through the wonder of his Holy Word. That was a fantastic, inspiring testimony, Matthew. Yeah. It really was. It was that, that the power of the word is in its holiness. Yes. Because it's, it's so above us. It's so powerful. It's a holy love. A holy power. And it's so whole that when we start to partake of it and absorb it into our life, it has a holy effect on us. You know, who you mix with, who you become. And you're not really realising that when, you, when you're reading his word, you're partaking of his holy, the essence of his person. You know, in the Bible, um, it talks about him being holy, holy, holy. You, you'll never see in the Bible where he's love, 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 or his grace, 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 or his forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. The highest aspect of his character, the purity of who he is, is all summed up in holy. The angelic beings that, that, that are around the throne, that their face are covered by all their wings because they cannot dare to even look on the face of God. He is so holy. And yet they're created beings. You'd think they'd be pure enough, but no. In, in honour, uh, in, 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 in reverence and awe, they are before the throne with their, their wings before them without looking at his face and they're saying to each other, holy, holy, holy. What fascinates me, the Bible says they say holy, holy, holy three times. But in actual fact, they're saying it thousands and thousands and thousands of years continuously and will continue until the end of time and there's no end of time. So it's not just three times, it says holy, 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 holy. They are overcome with awe and I believe in just in the presence without seeing God, in the very presence of God, they are overcome by the growing reality of who he is. Surely when, when, you, when you read the Bible and you see these people, when they came into his holy presence, they fell on their face. They were overcome, right? When we look at the Bible, we, we can look at um, people like Moses. And uh, Moses believed in God. But he didn't know God. But he believed in him. But he messed up. So he's out there, and all of a sudden, as you know, there's a bush burning, but it's not burning. But it's burning, but it's not burning, right? So there's a bush burning, it's burning, but it's not burning. You would have to think, 
this is out of this world. So he's drawn to it, as we all are by these things. So he's drawn to this bush, and when he comes to it, God says, Moses, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. No, you're on holy ground. You know, when, when, when Moses came closer to that bush, he came more, more closer into the, the, a greater intensity of the person of God who is holy. Moses said this, Who am I? The first thought, amazing he could think that, because in actual fact, when you come into the, an intensity of the person of God, you lose all focus of yourself and you don't even know who you are and it's the last thing you want to know. In, in, when you come into the intensity of God's presence, the more that his presence is evident, the more you're so, it's, it's, you, you're not even aware of yourself, but you're aware that you're so full of love. And this love is like, you are love, because you are love to such an intensity. And so there's nothing in your life that can stand in that moment, in, in that place of holy presence. The only place I've ever discovered where it's impossible for me to sin is when I'm in the presence of God. Because I can't think wrong. I can't act wrong. Because I can't do anything. I'm overcome by the reality of God. So can you see what God can do when we live in his presence? And, and he comes in, in waves and, and we get different intensities of his presence. It does different things to us. So here's Moses. It, it, just before he lost all sense of himself, he's saying, who am I? He realises that he's becoming nothing in the presence of such a, a holy presence. And God says, the question isn't who are you? The question really is, who am I? And you know what Moses did? Moses said, what is your name? And that, that is really interesting. Um, there's, a, there's a verse, it's in, you haven't got it on the screen, it's Exodus 6 verses 2 to 3. And it says that God spoke to Moses, I am the Lord. He said, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob as God Almighty. So he came to Moses, and Moses very wisely said, What is your name? The other guys, Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph, all those before him, God, who are you? And God gave them a title. With Abraham, God said, I am God Almighty. That wasn't his name, that was his title. That was the, if, if you want to go right into it, that was the, the, the aspect of God that. Abraham needed to achieve the purpose of his life and live with God the way he did. But with Moses, Moses said, what is your name? And God's holy. But God's love. And with his holy love, he says, my name is Lord. I am, I, I am that I am. Lord. Now, if we can skip over to uh, Psalm 8.1, I'll show you what I'm referring to. I've gone all over this soon, but it's okay. Um, if, if we got, oh, beautiful. Oh, that's wrong. Ah, oh, dear. I don't know what, what version is that, but it's wrong. I'll tell you why. Look at it. Psalm 8 1 it says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent your name and all the earth, and who have set your glory above the heavens. In good Bibles, it says, O oh Lord, and the first Lord is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Right? So it's, O oh Lord. Now when Moses said, what is your name? God said, my name is Lord. Capital, I mean, it's got all different names of Jews, it's got Yahweh and all this sort of stuff, but I'm just telling you, the Bible, the purity of the Bible says, God's name is Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. So that's his holy name. 
And they said, oh, Lord, using his name, our Lord. And when it's capital L, small case, O-R-D, you got it? That's his title. God is Lord of Lords. He's the Lord. But his name is high case. And if you know that, when you look at the Bible in the Old Testament, you'll find every now and then they're referring to him, they're referring to his name, and other times they're referring to his title. It's like this. You can come up to me and say, Pastor Barry, and I'll say yes. And then I'll relate to you as the pastor, as the title. Right? So I got a title and so that's how it is and Mr Albanese is the Prime Minister but that's not his name anyway so you can relate to a person by the title, their office right Police and Graham but then you can come to a place with a person where they'll say oh my name is Barry so when you come to me you say Pastor Barry I'll say yes and I'll put that on and all of a sudden, I'll relate to you as a pastor. But if I was to speak, if you were to know my name, that's my person. That's all of who I am. That's all of my 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 whole character. So I can I can be Barry and, and serve as a pastor as an aspect of my character, or I can be Barry and be the person I am. So I can be all sorts of things like you are. And you, you'll get to know the fullness of me because you know my name. Now this is, a, this is the, I'm, I'm laboring on this, but this is a, a most incredible thing. God gave Moses his own personal name. He's not just from God, you know. He's Lord, or I am that I am. It's just the whole I won't labour it. In the in the vision that I, Isaiah had in, in Isaiah six, you know the angels were around the throne, and they're saying, "Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty." That Lord is high case. The angels are saying that they're they're, they're 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 referring to that. Well, look at that. There it is. There in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I don't know what that. We, we've got to have. No, it's not there, is it? Look, holy, holy is the Lord. It should be capital, the whole thing of the Lord. Okay, is that right in your Bible? I'm not, I'm not taking a stray line. It, it's, yeah. yeah, I don't know where that comes from. What version is that? New King James. Wow. Oh, well, it must be two New King James. <laughs> I don't know, but please, that's a, that's a, it's a, it's a small thing, but it's not, it's a big thing. I'll tell you what's big. God, whose name is Lord, sent his son, and his son paid the price for all of us because we we're in such a place that we couldn't know God, person to person, who is holy, who is Lord. But he sent his son. And his son paid the price that we should pay, right? In love, he sent his son, and his son went to the cross and paid all the price. So justice was fulfilled. It is finished. And now, through Jesus, we can come face to face to the throne of grace with the Father God, with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Because they are Lord. But the fascinating, incredible thing that God said under the new covenant, he said, this one, he pointed to his son Jesus, and he said, this one, his name is Jesus, and he has the name that's above every other name. So what the Father was saying, in essence, without going too far, but what he's saying is, you can use the name of Jesus and you're relating through the person, the actual person of Jesus to me and to you. And through that name, through, it, it's just 
you know, he's more, I don't know how to put it in the words, but can, can you catch it? We're calling him Jesus and it's so, we're so casual about it, so flippant about it. So his name is Jesus, you know, he's the Lord. It's, it's so much bigger than that. Because of the holiness of God, the whole thing is so much greater. God is so much greater. Jesus is, is, is the greatest of the greatest of the great, and he lives in you. And because he lives you in, in you and I, this holy of holy of holiest, he's the holiest of holiest, he lives in us. And so he, with his Holy Spirit and through the Holy Word, if we relate to him and, and, and yield ourselves to him and allow him to do his work, the only work he can do in us is holiness. To, to bring us into a place where we've come to know God in all fullness. We'll come to know him in a greater way. We all think we know him and we do, but there's, there's so much more. But the thing that separates us from the holiness, the purity, the perfection of this person, God, is unholiness. And we can't help that. We're born in that. We're just born in unholy people. But we have Jesus in us now, and he's dealt with all of the sins of the past and so on, so that we can stand boldly before him in all of his holiness, and we can be in our holiness and unholiness, if you like, who we are today, and Jesus covers us. See, under the Old Testament, when Adam and Eve came out of that wonderful place, then God worked with them and they, God never left them completely, but they couldn't relate to him as a person, you know, face to face, person to person. They could relate to him as the God who was over us, but not have a personal relationship. They, 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 they worked out all sorts of things like, you know, uh, the sacrifices, the feasts and all those sort of things to, so that they could have their sins covered. But while, while there was a covering on them, you know, a covering separated them from the relationship of reality with God. So God worked with them and, and they never repeated. They just went and did their services and that's it. And, and God didn't really instigate it fully, but it was the best way they could live in, in the condition they were in. But we've got Jesus now. And so we can, as an example, we can, we can take a hold, you know, like I said, the word of God's holy. <clears throat> Just for chance, if you took Isaiah 6, 1 to 5, you know, we, we can read it. And then we see it and you see, oh, I don't know what's happened there, that's fantastic. Look at that. Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. There it is. It's done. How'd that happen? A miracle. <laughs> it, is. it is a miracle. We've just corrected the Bible. <laughs> but that's how it is. But you know, there's a wonderful principle. Get involved with the wholeness of the word. Don't question it and challenge all oh, it means this or it means that. No, it means what it says and it says what it means. So take a hold of it. Don't, don't let your mind start to get involved. Well, I can see in the Greek it says that. No, I don't care what it is. All I want to do is have the word affect my life. And cause me to become more like him because the more that I become like him the more I can know him in greater way so things like that it's interesting but you know what that that's got that's that Isaiah 6 1 to 5 has got such a power in it because the angelic beings there are, are telling us something wonderful holy holy is the is the, the God who whose name he's given to you that he wants us to come into that so it comes into us and changes us and affects us. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, oh, did that, didn't I? Yeah. Did that. Go on. Um, you know, I've got a pretty good job this time. <laughs> So his standards found in his holiness and um, the key to him, 
is that he's holy. And he says to us, doesn't he? Be ye holy as I am holy. Right? But he's not saying, be as holy as I am, because that's not going to happen on this earth, but be holy because I am holy. God, am I going to be holy? How can I stop this, this thing that takes me into stuff I should be? How can I do that? And God says, well, I've actually sent you my Holy Spirit and my Holy Word so that if you relate to me, you will become holy as I am holy. Isn't that amazing? See, I talked about his love, it's unfailing, but there's something beautiful about his love, it's holy. It's holy whole. It, it's just, just like really the best way to experience the best way, sorry, to, to know what God's holiness is, is to experience God, right? Now, we've all in different measures and different ways experienced God. I can have a, a sour, a sour smoking. Um, when I first got saved, I was, and, uh, and I knew straight away this has got to go. Um, especially went to church and all these loving people would smell them. You hot, you smoke breath, but they just love you, it drove you mad because you knew what they were thinking, but they were just loving you, you know. So uh, I, I thought, I've got to do something about this. I went to God because I couldn't give it up. I couldn't. And it was upsetting many people that I smoked. Mm. Uh, <laughs> wind the window down, put your hair on your job. <laughs> Wasn't it a, a loving thing to do? But anyway, I couldn't get rid of it, right? So I, I just started to cry out to God in, in the way and, and look to the scriptures. And, and, and I had this in mind, in, in my mind as I related to God, well, I need to get rid of this smoking. Like that. that was a part of what I was looking to God for without consciously being hammering it. But it was just that aspect of my life that was bringing before God that God had got an addiction. I spoke him, and it's wrong. And, you know, it just... The desire just left. I can't explain it. All I can think of is that when I brought my, my, my trouble to God, because of his holy person, he affected me. And it changed me. So it, it wasn't that I had to go and put patches or, or and if you put patches, okay, but it, I didn't have to do that. Because I didn't know how to do that. I didn't know what to do. But I knew that go to God and his holy person would do something to me. You know? So I'm preaching this because it's important. Sometimes we forget that he is holy. But like we're living in a very, very unholy world. Right? And and even, even in the church without knocking it, we're, we're today we're, we're not really conscious of his holiness. We're not really conscious, I don't think, um, of how much he desires us to be like him and how much he desires to help us. And now that because of what Jesus has done, the door is open that he can come into our very lives and change us just by being who he is with a holy love, a holy grace, the holiness of him. You know? And, and so if, if we lose that aspect of his holiness without being mortal, then we're more... You know, we see, we see, you know, compromise and diversity and things like that being accepted, um, and so therefore our our standard goes down, if you know what I mean. And we don't realise that the, the more we allow unholiness to come into life, the less power of God we have, the less of Him being able to change and affect us. See, as He is holy. He, he affects us and changes us. Well, guess what? It, it's in our holiness that we affect others. The unsaved, the people, they, 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 they realise there's something different about you. Yeah, there is. It's the Holy Spirit. It's, it's my life that I've decided without being religiously bound with rules and regulations that in my relationship with the God who is so holy and I have his name, so I, I'm not talking about God who is holy, I'm talking about the, the person of God. I, I can go to him 
hey mate, don't call him that, but you know, you can if you like, I suppose. But, but I'm, I'm talking to the person and I'm looking to him because his holiness I know will affect me and make me holy so that my kids and my grandkids and who knows, my great grandkids will be affected by the holiness of my character. Right? Holiness doesn't make you pious. It makes you real. You know, because if you want reality, God is real, isn't he? So it's not a matter of becoming so separate. But it is separate, isn't it? Holiness is being set apart from all this unholiness and, and the waves of the world. So never forget, he is holy, but relate to him as holy in love. Let's pray.